see something creepy. My green screen is here and I noticed it was poking into the, the side or the frame and I I realized I can peel away reality if I wanted to. Know that if you ever wrong me I can peel away reality. This is Jake Simple ASMR. So good to be recording another video. I feel like I've been pretty absent recently. I had a strange October. I, I, you already know I was out. I was out of power for a week, and then I had this awesome opportunity sprung upon me. But that meant that I had less free time, and I was under more stress. So I have not made as many videos as I'd like in the past month, and I still owe you some Halloween videos, so this is that, I suppose. I thought I would experiment and do a scary Wikipedia reading from spooky, scary, creepy Wikipedia articles I found online since... Uh, you all seem to love the scary story reading so much. I thought I would try this and see how you react. Please do let me know in the comments how this uh, measures up. If you like spooky stuff, spooky readings, whatever, please throw me a subscribe because it is a big part of what I do. And um, leave a like if you like the video. All of these things. Very nice of you. Very helpful. Okay, now these are going to be kind of um, entry-level creepy Wikipedia things that are uh, pretty commonplace, I guess, but nonetheless just very unnerving. I tried to leave out any of them that are like brutal murders or like diseases, um, anything that's too real. I, I don't, I'm not going for like extremely disturbing. I'm going for, like, unnerving. Um, and some of them are, like, lore and, and ghost type stuff. So the first one I'm gonna read you is for black-eyed children. Black-eyed children, or black-eyed kids, is a European contemporary legend of paranormal creatures that resemble children between ages 6 and 16, with pale skin and black eyes, who are reportedly seen hitchhiking or begging, or are encountered on doorsteps of residential homes. History while tabloid coverage of these creatures has claimed that tales of black-eyed children have existed since the 1980s, most sources indicate that the legend originated from 1996 postings written by Texas reporter Brian Bethel on a ghost-related mailing list relating to alleged encounters with black-eyed children. Bethel describes encountering two such children in Abilene, Texas in 1996 and claims that a second person had a similar, unrelated encounter in Portland, Oregon. Bethel's stories have become regarded as a classic examples of creepy pasta and gained such popularity that he published a FAQ just to keep up with demand for more info about the urban legend. In 2012, Brian Bethel told his story on reality TV series Monsters and Mysteries in America. He wrote a follow-up article for the Abilene Reporter News, describing his experience and maintaining his belief that it was legitimate. In 2012, the horror film Black Eyed Kids was produced with Kickstarter funding, its director commenting that the creepy children were quote, an urban legend that's been floating around on the internet for years now. I always thought it was fascinating. A 2013 episode of MSN's Weekly Strange that featured reports of black-eyed children is thought to have helped spread the legend on the internet. During one week in September 2014, the British tabloid Daily Star ran three sensationalistic front-page stories about alleged sightings of black-eyed children connected to 
alleged sightings are taken seriously by ghost hunters, some of whom believe black-eyed children to be extraterrestrials, vampires, or ghosts. Science writer Sharon A. Hill was unable to find any documentation of black-eyed child encounters, including that the tales are passed on as friend-of-a-friend ghost stories. Hill considers the legend to resemble typical spooky folklore stories such as the phantom black dog, where the subject is not supernatural and there may never have been an actual original encounter. Snopes lists the phenomenon as being a legend. That was a good starter to your one, the Black Eyed Children. Um, I actually had heard of that one from, I had this scary storybook as a kid. Um, it had a purple cover and it was like a collection of scary stories for like people my age. It was like 11. Um, and it it was an American writer, and she was, you know, obviously probably just mining this folklore, urban legend stuff for it, which is cool. But I remember there was a story about some black-eyed children, and the kid, um, the kid, the main character of the kid, like his grandma was kind of classist, and the black-eyed children were just kind of like poor, and she didn't want them coming in, but it was like vampires, where... They won't come in unless invited, but if you invite them in, there's going to be trouble. So that one is clearly an urban legend. Some of these will be a little bit more unnerving because they're real, but... Another one. This one is good. I just learned about this one. Clinton Road in New Jersey. Clinton Road is located in West Milford, Passaic County, New Jersey. It runs in a generally north-south direction, beginning at Route 23 new, near Newfoundland, and running roughly 10 miles to its northern terminus at Upper Greenwood Lake. The road and the land around it have gained notoriety over the years as an area rife with many legends of paranormal occurrences, such as sightings of ghosts, strange creatures, and gatherings of witches, Satanists, and the Ku Klux Klan. It is also rumored that professional killers dispose of bodies in the surrounding woods, with one recorded case of this occurring. It has been a regular subject of discussion in Weird NJ magazine, which once devoted an entire issue to it. In the words of a local police chief, it's a long, desolate stretch and makes the imagination go nuts. There are very few houses along the road and much of the adjoining property is underdeveloped, publicly owned woodlands either City of Newark Watershed or State Forest, and the road itself is a narrow two-lane highway that receives little maintenance. It's not part of New Jersey's county route system, and was until fairly recently unpaved for some of its length, connecting two areas of minimal population and growth and thus having little traffic even at the busiest times of day. It is also notorious for having the country's longest traffic light wait. This occurs at a double intersection where Route 23 crosses the road. The two lights can cause motorists to wait for five minutes in total. The lengthy wait was a result of traffic planners giving increased priority to Route 23 to reduce backups during rush hour. Isn't that just perfect that if you are being pursued by a ghost, you're going to be stuck at a traffic light for 10 minutes and that ghost is going to have, if you're being pursued by the creature from It Follows and you're trying to escape through New Jersey, I'm just going to say don't go down Clinton Road because that's going to give the creature a lot of time to catch up with you. Any creature.
creature. It doesn't have to be that one. If any creature is pursuing you, stay off Clinton Road. Please. Okay, the history of Clinton Road. I'm sorry if I'm spooking you awake with my voice. Okay. The, the road, like the reservoir and stream in the area, gets its name from the original settlement of Clinton, which was located about where the road crosses the brook. On May 14, 1983, the body of Daniel Deppner was found when a cyclist riding down Clinton Road in a wooded area of West Milford, New Jersey, spotted the corpse being, okay, spotted the corpse, redacted. The body had been wrapped the body was clearly disposed of by, it was disposed of. Richard Kuklinski was charged and convicted of his murder, so they found the killer. Cool. Legends and folklore. The different areas along or near Clinton Road have been much cited as the setting of urban legends especially by the publication Weird NJ, which has devoted numerous articles to this subject. Number one, Ghost Boy Bridge. According to Weird NJ, there is a legend that if someone puts a quarter in the middle of the road where the yellow line is at one of the bridges over the Clinton Dead Man's Curve that does not help dispel the myths. Near the reservoir, at midnight, it will supposedly be promptly returned to the ghost of a boy who drowned while swimming below, or had fallen in while sitting on the edge of the bridge. In some tellings, an apparition is seen. In others, the ghost pushes the teller into the water if they look over the side of the bridge in order to save them from being run over as he was in life. Ghost Boy Bridge sounds like something flirty. I need to put that in my back pocket. Like, do you want to come to Ghost Boy Bridge with me? You can tell I'm really good at flirting. Okay. Number two, besides the ghost boy, there have been other ghosts described by weird NJ readers. One claims to have seen a ghost Camaro driven by a girl who supposedly died when she crashed it in 1988. Any mention while driving the road at night is supposed to trigger a manifestation. I hate those ones where if you talk about them, they become real. Another claims to have encountered two park rangers one night while camping with friends near Terrace Pond, a glacial tarn on a ridge accessible from the road by hiking trails, who in the morning turned out to have been the ghosts of two rangers who had died on the job in 1939. Other weird NJ readers claim to have seen people dressed weirdly at odd hours who simply stare at those who see them and do not speak, who either disappear or are not seen by others present. I'm going to light some incense because you might be surprised to hear that I'm really spooked out sitting alone in this room reading this stuff right now, so hold on. Okay, this incense contains sage. I'm not very well educated on the correct usage of sage, but it can't hurt. Or maybe it can, I don't know. Let's hope. Next, legend of Clinton Road is the Druidic Temple, a conical stone structure just east of the road south of the reservoir was said by weird NJ readers to be a site where local druids practice their rituals and horrible things might come to pass for any intruder who looked too closely or came at the wrong time. The building is 
classic set is actually an iron smelter built in 1826. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places as Glinton Furnace in 1976. It is currently fenced off by the Newark Water Department to prevent any entrance and the liability for injury that might result. Ghost Truck Number 4 According to the Travel Channel Show, Most Terrifying Places in America do. Phantom vehicles such as pickup trucks or even floating headlights not attached to any vehicle supposedly appear from nowhere in the middle of the night and chase drivers to the end of the road, then disappear. That's horrifying. Strange Creatures, number five. From a hellhound, aka Wolfie, an experimental albino wolf dog, to monkeys and unidentifiable hybrids, are alleged by Weird NJ to have been seen at night. If not of supernatural origin, they are said to have been survivors of jungle habitat, a nearby attraction that has been closed since 1976, which have managed to survive and crossbreed. Scary. Cross Castle. In 1905, a man named Richard Cross built a castle on high land near the reservoir for his wife and three children. Later in the 20th century, it fell into ruin after a fire had destroyed part of it and thus became a popular destination for hikers and local teenagers looking for secluded locations to camp out and have parties. According to Weird NJ, visitors have written telling of strange occurrences in or near the castle site, such as people going into seizures and having bruises appearing on their bodies afterwards, or having strange, disturbing visions. Writings that suggest satanic symbols have been reported as appearing on the castle's interior walls, particularly in areas that were supposedly inaccessible. Newark's Water Department raised the castle as an attractive nuisance in 1988, and the foundations remain and several hiking trails still lead to the site. I absolutely love the phrase, attractive nuisance. Like, I think it means it attracts people who act annoying, but an attractive nuisance is like a good way to describe me. Okay, this one is crazy, and this is when things ramp up a little bit. This is not just legend. Disappearance of Johnny Gosh. John David Gosh was a paper boy in West Des Moines, Iowa, who disappeared without a trace between 6 and 7 a.m. on September 5th, 1982. He is presumed to have been kidnapped. As of 2021, there have been no arrests made, and the case is now considered cold, but remains open. His mother, Noreen Gosh, claimed that Johnny escaped from his captors and visited her with an, un with an unidentified man in 1997. She claimed that her son told her that he had been the victim of a pedophile organization. She claimed that her son... She claimed that her son told her that he had been the victim of a trafficking organization and had been cast aside when he was too old, but subsequently feared for his life and lived under an assumed identity, feeling it was not safe to return home. Gosh's father, John, divorced from Noreen since 1993, has publicly stated that he is not sure whether or not such a visit actually occurred. Many have also speculated that the visit did occur, but it was someone else pretending to be Johnny. Authorities have not located Gosh or confirmed Noreen Gosh.
Russia's account and his fate continues to be the subject of speculation, conspiracy theories, and dispute. The case received huge publicity in 2006 when his mother claimed to have found photographs on her doorstep depicting Gosh in captivity. Some of the photos cl received were claimed to be children from a case in Florida, but one boy in the photos was never identified. Noreen Gosh insists that boy is Johnny. Gosh's picture was among the first to be featured on milk gardens as part of a campaign to find missing children. I probably will not read all of these, just the highlights, basically. So the disappearance. On Sunday, September 5th, 1982, in the suburb of West Des Moines, Johnny Gosh left home before dawn to begin his paper route. Although it was customary for Johnny to awaken his father to help with the route, the boy took only the family's miniature dachshund, Gretchen, with him that morning. Other paper carriers for the Des Moines Register would later report having seen Gosh at the paper drop, picking up his newspapers. It was the last sighting of Gosh that can be corroborated by multiple witnesses. A neighbor named Mike reported that he observed Gosh talking to a stocky man in a blue two-toned Ford Fairmont with Nebraska plates. Mike did not know what was discussed because he was observing from his bedroom window. As Gosh headed home, Mike noticed another man following Gosh. Another witness, John Rossi, saw a man in a blue car talking to Gosh and thought something was strange. He looked at the license plate but could not recall the plate number. He said, I keep hoping I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see that number on the license plate as distinctly as night and day, but that hasn't happened. Rossi underwent hypnosis and told police some of the numbers and that the plate was from Warren County, Iowa. John and Noreen Gosh, Johnny's parents, began receiving phone calls from customers along their son's route, complaining of undelivered papers. John performed a cur cursory search of the neighborhood around 6 a.m. He immediately found Johnny's wagon full of newspapers two blocks from their home. The Goshes immediately contacted the West Des Moines Police Department and reported Johnny's disappearance. Noreen, in her public statements in her book Why Johnny Can't Come Home, has been critical of what she perceives as a slow reaction time from authorities, and of the policy at the time that Gosh could not be classified as a missing person until 72 hours had passed. By her estimation, the police did not arrive to take her report for a full 45 minutes. Initially, the police came to believe that Gosh was a runaway, but later they changed their statement and suggested that Gosh was kidnapped, but they were unable to establish a viable motive. They turned up little evidence and arrested no suspects in connection with the case. A few months after his September 1982 disappearance, Noreen Gosh has said that her son was spotted in Oklahoma when a boy yelled to a woman for help before being dragged off by two men. Over the years, several private investigators have assisted the Goshes with the search for their son. Among them are Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City police detective, and Ted Gunderson, a retired chief of the Los Angeles FBI branch. In 1984, Gosh's photograph appeared alongside that of Juanita Rafaela Estevez on milk gardens across America. They were the second and third abducted children to have their plights published this or publicized this way. The first was Aton Pats. Another missing paper boy. On August 12, 1984, Eugene Martin, another Des Moines area paper boy, disappeared under 
similar circumstances. He disappeared while delivering newspapers on the south side of Des Moines. Authorities were unable to prove a connection between the three cases, yet Noreen Gosh claims that she was personally informed of the abduction a few months in advance by a private investigator who was searching for her son. She was told the kidnapping would take place the second weekend in August 1984, and it would be a paper boy from the south side of Des Moines. Fraud by Wire Case In 1985, Noreen Gosh received a letter from Robert Herman Meyer II, 19, of Saginaw, Michigan. The letter had been signed to Samuel for Samuel, see how jumpy I am? The smoke, like I saw the smoke moving from the corner of my eye. And anyway. Anyway. So, a letter from Robert Herman Meyer II, 19 years old, of Saginaw, Michigan. The letter had been signed to Samuel Forbes, Dakota, whereupon Meyer, acting as Dakota, stated that he was a guard in a motorcycle club when Gosh's son disappeared in September 1982. According to Meyer, Gosh's son was taken as part of a large child trafficking ring operated by the club. According to the FBI, Meyer requested from and received $11,000 from the Gosh's. Meyer additionally requested $100,000 more along with a promise to return their son. Meyer was arrested in Buffalo at the Canadian border by FBI agents and was later charged with fraud by wire. The letter Meyer wrote and stated that Gosh's son was sold to a man whom Meyer identified as a high-level drug dealer residing in Mexico City. Despite the accusation of fraud, Noreen Gosh reportedly believed Meyer at his word, and later criticized the FBI, stating that the arrest warrant against Meyer destroyed her and her husband John's credibility with anyone who would take the couple's offer to pay ransom for their boy. That's very interesting. Kind of probably predatory on the part of yeah. Okay, so this is the most interesting part, Noreen Gosh's claims. According to Noreen Gosh's account, she was awakened around 2.30 a.m. one morning in March 1997 by a knock at her apartment door. Waiting outside was Johnny Gosh, now 27 years old, accompanied by an unidentified man. Gosh said she immediately recognized her son who opened his shirt to reveal a birthmark on his chest. We talked about an hour or an hour and a half. He was with another man, but I have no idea who the person was. Johnny would look over to the other person for approval to speak, says Gosh. He didn't say where he is living or where he was going. In a 2005 interview, Gosh said that night he came he was wearing jeans and a shirt and had a coat on because it was March. It was cold and his hair was long. It was shoulder length and it was straight and dyed black. After the visit, she had the FBI create a picture, she says, looked like a Johnny. Gosh self-published a book in 2000 titled Why Johnny Can't Come Home. The book presents her understanding of what her son went through based on the original research of various private investigators and her son's visit. I already talked about the pictures that were delivered to her. I don't want to read that part because it's very dark and wrong and bad. Read about it at your own risk. Um, but yeah, according to the um, Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office, they actually knew who took the pictures, and it wasn't 
what um, it was purported to be, although one mystery is that one of the boys in the photographs was not identified. I don't know. I don't want to be, uh, I, um, I would look into this yourself if you are interested in that type of stuff. It's a very, very, I don't know, it's very disturbing thing in, on many levels. Okay, this next one is another just kind of, this one is weird. Um, it's very interesting. So this is June and Jennifer Gibbons. June Gibbons and Jennifer Gibbons were identical twins who grew up in Wales. They became known as the Silent Twins since they only communicated with each other. They wrote works of fiction. Both women were admitted to Broadmoor Hospital where they were held for 11 years. Um, the article will cover this, but it's just in the literary world, um, they are known, while well, June is known for producing um, a piece of folk art which is a self-published book called The Pepsi Cola Addict. And um, it's like rare, it's a rare find because there's only obviously so many copies of existence. But it's just like that, it's just a very interesting, kind of charming touch to this story. Anyway, June and Jennifer were the daughters of Caribbean immigrants Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons. The Gibbons family moved from Barbados to the United Kingdom in early 1960s as part of the Windrush generation. Gloria was a housewife and Aubrey worked as a technician for the Royal Air Force. The couple also had a daughter, Greta, born in 1957, and a son, David, born in 1959. In 1960, Aubrey went to stay with a relative in Coventry and soon qualified as a staff technician. Gloria followed with Greta and David several months later. The twins were born on April 11, 1963 at a military hospital in Aden, Yemen, where their father had been deployed. The family soon relocated, first to England, and in 1974 to Haverford, Haverford, West Wales. The twin sisters were inseparable, and their language, a sped-up Bajan Creole, made it difficult for people to understand them. They spoke a language um, amongst each other. Uh, twins will do that. They'll have their own language. The family's children were the only black children in the community. All of the children were ostracized at school. This proved to be traumatic for the twins, eventually causing their school administrators to dismiss them early each day so that they might avoid bullying. Their language became even more idiosyncratic at this time. Soon it was unintelligible to others. Their language, or idioglossia, qualified as an example of cryptophagia, exemplified by the twins' simultaneous actions, which often mirrored each other. The twins became increasingly reserved, and eventually spoke to no one except each other and their younger sister, Rose. The girls continued to attend school, although they refused to read or write. In 1974, a medic administering vaccinations at the school noted their impassive behavior and notified a child psychologist. The, twin began, the twins began seeing a succession of therapists who tried unsuccessfully to get them to communicate with others. They were sent to separate boarding schools in an attempt to break their isolation. But the pair became catatonic and entirely withdrawn when parted. That's the crazy part. That they didn't, they literally didn't, like, function socially in any way when they weren't together. Like, their, their entire social functioning shut down. Creative expression. When they were reunited, the two 
spend several years isolating themselves in their bedroom, engaged in elaborate plays with dolls. They created many plays and stories in a sort of soap opera style, reading some of them aloud on tape as gifts for their sister Rose. Inspired by a pair of gift diaries on Christmas 1979, they began their writing careers. They sent away for a mail-order course in creative writing, and each kept an extensive diary and wrote a number of stories, poems, and novels, set primarily in the United States and particularly in Malibu, California. The stories involve young men and women who exhibit strange and often criminal behavior. June wrote a novel titled Pepsi Cola Addict, in which the high school hero is seduced by a teacher, then sent away to a reformatory where a homosexual guard makes a play for him. The two girls pooled together their unemployment benefits in order to get the novel published by a vanity press. Their other attempts to publish novels and stories were unsuccessful. In Jennifer's The Pugilist, that's a great title for a novel, a physician is so eager to save his child's life that he kills the family dog to obtain his heart for a transplant. The dog's spirit lives on in the child and ultimately has its revenge against the father. Jennifer also wrote Discomania, the story of a young woman who discovers the atmosphere of a local disco and cites patrons to insane violence. She followed up with the taxi driver's son, a radio play called Postman and Postwoman, and several short stories. June Gibbons is considered to be an outsider writer. I really want to read all of June's works, especially, okay, the one with the dog art. Um, that's just, uh, the stories have a little bit of, like, a mythical quality to them, because I know if you, like, if you, like, read myths, there's always this absurd stuff happening like that, like a heart being taken from a dog to or a myth or a fable, you know? Like, I really like that. I've, I've, I've read a review of, the, of Pepsi Cola Addict, and it's, um, obviously, like, it's, like, not good writing, but... It's like mythology, but with, like, modern elements like Pepsi-Cola and, uh, what, like, reformatories and, and stuff like that. I really want to read these. Again, I find it's, like, darkly charming that they're just in their room for years making plays and stuff together. What a life. That sounds like kind of a nice life. I don't know. In their later teenage years, the twins began experimenting with drugs and alcohol. In 1981, the girls committed a number of crimes, including vandalism, petty theft, and arson, which led to their being admitted to, they just start day ones, to Broadmoor Hospital, literal partners in crime, a high-security mental health hospital. The twins were sentenced to indefinite detention under the Mental Health Act of 1983. They remained at Broadmoor for 11 years. June later blamed this lengthy sentence on their selective muteness. Juvenile delinquents get two years in prison. We got 12 years of hell because we didn't speak. We lost hope, really. I wrote a letter to the Queen asking her to get us out, but we were trapped. Placed on high doses of antipsychotic meds, they found themselves unable to concentrate. Jennifer apparently developed tardive dyskinesia, a neurological disorder resulting in involuntary, repetitive movements. Their medications were apparently adjusted sufficiently to allow them to continue the copious diaries they had begun in 1980, and they were able to join the hospital choir, but they lost most of their interest in creative writing. These girls were creatives. The case achieved notoriety due to newspaper coverage by journalist Marjorie Wallace of the Sunday Times. Wallace later wrote a book about the two called 
the silent discovered 
Mercury on August 20th, 2007 was on Jedediah Island in British Columbia. Feet have been discovered on the coast of islands in British Columbia and the U.S. cities of Tacoma and Seattle. In Canada, the BB, or sorry, in Canada, the BC Coroner Service said in December 2017 that foul play had been ruled out by authorities in all investigations and that the feet came from people who were killed either in accidents or by suicide and the feet detached during the normal decomposition process. The feet were usually found in sneakers, which the coroner thought were responsible for both keeping the feet buoyant enough to eventually wash ashore and for giving the feet enough protection from decomposition to be found relatively intact. Prior to the recent seeming rush of feet washing ashore, there have been earlier instances going back more than a century such as a leg in a boot that was found on a Vancouver beach in 1887. The most recent discovery was on January 1st, 2019, when people on Jetty Island in Everett, Washington, called police to report a boot with a human foot inside, which the coroner was able to match to Antonio O'Neill missing since December 12th, 2016. These foot discoveries are not the first ones on British Columbia's coast. One was found in Vancouver in 1887, leading to the place of discovery being called Leg and Boot Square. On July 30th, 1914, the Vancouver Sun reported that recent arrivals from Kim Squid reported a human leg encased in a high boot was found on a beach near the mouth of the Salmon River, a previous name for Dean River near Kimsquit, near the headwater of Dean Channel. It was thought the remains were from a man who had drowned on the river the previous summer. As of September 2018, 15 feet have been found in the Canadian province of British Columbia between 2007 and 2018, and five in the U.S. state of Washington. The feet include a number of matched pairs. Okay, that makes... That is uh, a little bit of a relief. <laughs> just because that gives plausibility to the story that it was just decomposition because of both feet are coming ashore then. Okay. In British Columbia, 13 of the 15 feet have been identified. The latest was a left foot found on the shore of a rocky beach in West Vancouver, British Columbia in December or in September 2018 and through DNA analysis linked to a male that went missing earlier that year. The two unidentified feet found in February 2016 washed up on the shore of Botanical Beach in the west coast of Vancouver Island. Adjacent to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. In the U.S., one of these pairs belonged to a woman who jumped from a bridge. Of the other two U.S. feet identified, one foot belonged to a missing fisherman and the other of a depressed man who probably committed suicide. His identity was withheld on request of his family. After the fifth foot was discovered of the 20, the story had begun to receive increased international media attention. With major headlines from newspapers such as the Melbourne Herald Sun, The Guardian, and The Cape Times in South Africa, the story elicited much speculation about the cause of the mystery originating from morbid fascination with this type of subject. As stated by one scientist who identifies remains of victims, on his late night talk show, David Letterman questioned two Canadian audience members about the mystery. Another apparently human foot, I love that phrase, an apparently human foot, discovered on June 18th, 2000.
2008 on Tai Spit near Campbell River on Vancouver Island was a hoax. The hoax was a skeletonized animal paw which was put in a sock and shoe and then stuffed with dried seaweed. Royal Canadian Mounted Police launched an investigation. After the 11th foot was found on August 31st, 31st 2011 in Vancouver, several running shoes containing what police suspected was raw meat were found washed up on Oak Beach, British Columbia. Okay. So, there is the plausible explanation of decomposition separating the foot stuff like that, and then, you know, the, the shoes being buoyant and all that, but there is a note here, however, finding feet and not the rest of the bodies has been deemed unusual. Finding two feet has been guessed at million to one odds and has, been, has thus been referred to as an anomaly by one police officer. The finding of the third foot made it the first time a police officer interviewed and knew that knew about that three such discoveries had been made so close to each other. Okay. I was starting to find that one disappointing. Like most of reality, in that most of reality makes sense and is boring, but that part really, as far as we know, this is a little different. It's a little weird that these feet are washing ashore. But who knows? Okay. Yeah, let me know. Uh, please let me know your feedback. Um, I just picked ones that I thought were interesting. I like these, these Wikipedia things because um, real life mysteries, real life stories with all the messiness and all the the mundaneness, when things happen to be this weird or creepy, it just, it's a different kind of spooky. Obviously, folklore, like the first two, are spooky in their own right, but that's my opinion. Let me hear yours. Um, thanks so much for watching.